This week we're continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount, following on from Duncan's talk about anger and murder last week. And this week I've got the task of talking to you about lust and adultery. So thanks for that. I don't know who put together the rota, but brilliant. As Duncan explained last week, the Sermon on the Mount is a kind of blueprint for Christian living. Um, Jesus is unpacking the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses after the Israelites had been rescued from slavery in Egypt. And you can read all about the, the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 in the Old Testament. The Sermon on the Mount is showing us how we are to live as Christians. Um, Duncan helped us to see the contrast between the Pharisees, who were the religious people of the day, who saw the commandments as a set of legal standards that you'd either passed or failed, and Jesus, who put a spotlight on the problem of our sinful hearts. We saw last week that Jesus identifies anger as the root of murder, and he shows that our heart problem of anger needs to be addressed through repentance and forgiveness. And now we come to the seventh of the Ten Commandments, do not commit adultery. And we're going to see that just like anger sows murder, lust sows adultery. So first of all, I wanted to talk about the problem of the heart. Have a look again at verses 27 to 28. Jesus says, you have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Lust is sexually desiring someone that you shouldn't have and fantasising about them. Just as we can commit murder in our hearts through angry thoughts and words, we can commit adultery in our hearts through lustful thoughts and desires. As we saw last week, the real problem that leads to sinful outward actions is the problem of the heart. The real problem that leads to sinful outward actions is the problem of the heart. We need to recognise a couple of things in order to be able to understand this passage properly. So first of all, the Bible doesn't say that sex is bad. I think sometimes Christians are viewed as being against sex, aren't they? But Jesus isn't approved. He doesn't say that all sex is bad or that we should always feel guilty about sexual desire. Sex is a wonderful gift from God in the right context. Genesis 1 and 2 and the book of Song of Songs show us that within marriage between a man and a woman, sex is a wonderful act of intimacy and love. In fact, it's even more than that. It's a sign pointing to the faithful love of God for his bride, the church. In Ephesians 5.32, the Apostle Paul explicitly connects the marriage relationship with the relationship between Christ and the church. And the book of Revelation right at the end of the Bible teaches that one day all God's people, the bride of Christ, will be united to the bridegroom Jesus. This is the point of sex and marriage. And in fact, to help understand this, I've got a little video to show you now. A trailer at the cinema has been designed to make you want to enjoy the film it advertises. It gives you a foretaste of a future reality that could be yours if you watch the film. Sex and marriage have been designed to make you want to enjoy the future they advertise. They give you a foretaste of a future reality that could be yours if you follow Jesus. Any joy in sex and marriage now is just a trailer for the future joy all Christians will experience united, married to God's Son Jesus forever. So, if you get to enjoy sex and marriage now, you're just enjoying the trailer. If you don't enjoy sex and marriage now, you're just missing the trailer. All who follow Jesus will get to enjoy the real thing. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video and it helped you to see the point of sex and marriage. So this is why all sex outside that context is so damaging. It distorts the gospel. So Jesus' teaching about avoiding lustful desires shows us how much he loves us and wants us to reflect the committed, faithful love that he has for us. 
So that's the first mini point in this section, that the Bible doesn't say that sex is bad. And secondly, Jesus is talking about all forms of sexual immorality. Jesus isn't just speaking to married people or just to men. He is addressing all forms of sexual immorality. That's sex outside of a marriage between one man and one woman. So this challenging passage applies to every single one of us, whether we experience heterosexual or same sex temptations, whether we're attracted to someone who is married to someone else, or whether we're addicted to pornography or tempted to gratify ourselves with hookup culture, we all have impure thoughts. Paul's teaching in Romans 1 shows the devastating effects of the fall, our rebellion against God, the fact that these effects have tainted every area of life for every human being. As he says in chapter 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So none of us have a reason to feel smug or self-righteous when it comes to sexuality. So the first point is that the problem that shows itself outwardly in adultery or sleeping around or porn or sex outside marriage is a problem in our hearts and none of us are immune. Secondly, our heart condition is serious. Look again at verses 29 to 30. Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. So we can see here, can't we, that sexual temptation is powerful. Jesus deliberately uses hyperbole here, which is just a posh way of saying that he exaggerates to make a point. He doesn't really want us to gouge our eyes out or chop off limbs, but he does want us to take sexual temptation extremely seriously and recognise its power to corrupt us. There have been a number of high profile Christian leaders who have fallen into sexual sin, which is tragic, but it shows the danger of entertaining even a hint of private lust. Have you ever seen on a TV show where a couple end up in bed and they say things like, oh, it just happened or we couldn't help it? The truth is that things never just happen. Sexual immorality is born long before any physical acts in the hidden lusts of our hearts. The choice of eyes and right hands isn't an accident either. We need to be ruthless about what we look at and make sure it's not fueling lust. And we need to be self-controlled in what we do with our bodies. If your eye is causing you to sin, don't look. If we flirt with temptation by clicking on certain internet sites or watching certain films or spending time alone with certain people, that's a disaster. Sometimes the tempting things may seem harmless in themselves but could lead us into danger. We know where we're weak and prone to sin. And Jesus' teaching is clear. Run away from those temptations. Don't see how near the cliff edge you can get before you fall off. Stay well away. Our world is full of temptations, but we're living for something better than this world. We're citizens of the kingdom of God. We mustn't absorb the world's values and be seduced by its pleasures. Flirting with sexual temptations, a bit like juggling with lit fireworks, is going to end badly. Which leads me on to my second point in this section. Sexual sin is massively damaging. Our culture bears witness to the fact that sexual sin wrecks lives. We see children without parents, couples bitterly fighting over once shared possessions, lives scarred by abuse. Even in relationships where it doesn't seem like anyone is getting hurt, maybe the nice young couple who are living together but haven't quite got round to getting married, or the lesbians who've been together for 20 years. Sex outside God's blueprint is damaging. We saw earlier that the whole point of sex is to show people what God's love is like. Any sex outside of this committed covenant relationship of marriage is distorting the gospel message of God's faithful love for his people. Sex is a good and powerful thing that needs to be contained within the boundaries that God sets. 
So our heart condition is serious because we're all vulnerable to sexual sin and sexual sin is a big deal. So what's the good news? Well, my third main point is that Jesus transforms our hearts. Jesus has diagnosed the problem as a problem of the heart. And elsewhere in scripture, we learn that God himself gives us a transformed heart. We're all sexually broken in some way. It might look different for different people, but if we're honest, we've all lusted after other people. We recognise that none of us are sexually pure, whether we're married or single, straight or same-sex attracted, male or female, whether we've had an affair in practice or in our minds. But we don't need to despair. Jesus understands what we're like and he doesn't leave us that way. The problem is the heart, but God has given us a heart transplant. The problem is the heart, but Jesus has given us a heart transplant. Look at this promise that God gives to the Israelite people in Ezekiel chapter 36. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. The way that God's people can follow God's laws is by having God's spirit inside them. Remember when Nicodemus had a sneaky meeting with Jesus at night and Jesus tells him that Christians are people who are to be born again, born again of the spirit. You can read about that in John chapter 3. It's the Holy Spirit of God living inside us rather than external rules that gives us the power to live God's way. <clears throat> in Paul's letter to the Galatians chapter 5 he says the acts of the flesh are obvious sin sexual immorality impurity and debauchery idolatry and witchcraft hatred discord jealousy fits of rage selfish ambition dissensions factions and envy drunkenness orgies and the like I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those be who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. God's Spirit gives us the self-control to overcome lust, adultery and all sexual immorality and to live the life of purity that we were created for. So let's summarise what we've seen from this passage. Firstly, we've seen that sexual immorality is fundamentally a problem of the heart. It arises when we allow sexual temptations to grow into lustful thoughts. Just as Jesus taught us to cut out angry thoughts which lead to the act of murder, he teaches us to cut off lustful thoughts that are the root of wrongful sexual relationships. We also saw that God is not against sex and that it's to be enjoyed in its proper place, a marriage between one man and one woman, and that this is a symbol to the whole world of God's amazing and faithful love for all of us. Secondly, we've seen that sexual immorality is serious. Sexual temptation is powerful and universal. It's not just a little bit naughty or a silly mistake. It damages our relationship with God and our relationship with others. It tears apart the fabric of the gospel. It breaks families and communities. We misrepresent the image of a holy God when we act in an unholy way. It damages our own walk with God and our gospel witness to the society around us. Lust, adultery and sexual immorality are a big deal and we need to be serious about cutting them out of our lives. And finally, we've seen that Jesus transforms our hearts for us and gives us Holy Spirit power to resist sexual temptation. We don't have to battle alone. In fact, if we try to go it alone, we won't succeed. Only Jesus can get to the root of the problem and make our hearts pure, giving us the self-control to walk away from sexual sin. So how are we to respond? This teaching is challenging for all of us. 
Sexual sin is universal. You may think that you're the only one struggling with temptations and fantasies, but you're not. I would encourage you to find another Christian who you trust and be open about your struggles, even if it feels a bit embarrassing at first. We all need people who can hold us accountable and pray for us. Sin grows in darkness, but if we shine the light of Christ on even our darkest thoughts, we will find that his power will transform our hearts and minds. So let's have a few moments of quiet to do business with God and then I'll close in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the Sermon on the Mount, the teaching that shows us how to live as a Christian. Lord, thank you that we are um, saved by grace and that we're able to live in this way because of the Holy Spirit that is inside us. Lord, thank you that um, you transform our broken hearts and enable them to, um, to beat for you and help us to live for you in lives that are holy and reflect the character of our holy God. Lord, I pray um, for those of us who've been really challenged by this message this morning and those of us who are struggling with sexual temptations, with lustful thoughts. Um, Lord, thank you that we are not alone in this and thank you that you know and that you understand. Help us to be honest and open with you. Help us to seek counsel from wise Christians who we can um, get prayer support from um, and who can ask us difficult questions. Lord, thank you that you don't leave us to live the Christian life alone, but you empower us to live it um, through your spirit. And we ask now that you would fill us with the spirit. Um, help us to live obediently um, according to your law um, so that the world can see your holiness, your goodness. In your name. Amen. Thanks very much. Back to Emily.